The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another ANA eLearning Academy presentation. The ANA would like to thank our eLearning partner, Graysheet, for their support of our eLearning program. Today, we have Michael Kotis, who will be presenting Prince of Youth, Coinage Traces, the Rise and Fall of Publius Septimius Geta, a Severan ruler. All attendees will be muted for this presentation. If you have any questions, you may put them in the chat or Q&A box, and I will review them with Michael at the end of the presentation. I will now turn the time over to our presenter. Michael, when you're ready, the floor is yours, sir. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, the talk today is based on and grew out of a, um, an exhibit that I sh presented at the World's Fair of Money just last summer. And, uh, all of the coins are mine except for for one and all of the photos of coins are mine as well um, the one that's not I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully remember to point out to you when we get to it um, the, this is the result of over 20 years of collecting and the first several slides that I'm going to show you are some necessary context um, background information that we'll start with and then we'll go in to start looking at some coins so, First to start with the introduction. This talk presents coins illustrating the story of the Roman emperor Geta, who reigned from AD 198 to 211. Born Lucius Septimius Geta on 7 March 189, from 203 onward, his praenomen changed from Lucius to Publius. And praenomen is a Latin term for basically it's, it's equivalent to his first name. Let's get that slide to change. Okay. His old, older brother, Antoninus, born in 188, is known to us today as the Emperor Caracalla, and he reigned from 196 to 217. Geta is thought to have been born in Rome or Mediolanum, which is present day Milan, and Caracalla in Lugdunum, which is present day Lyon. Yet their Punic father, Severus, hailed from Leptis Magna in North Africa. Their mother, Julia, was a Syrian high priestess of royal birth. The boy's mixed heritage attests to the mobility and cosmopolitan makeup of the vast Roman empire during the late second and early third centuries AD. In dynastic profile on this masterfully engraved Roman gem, this is actually a print of a, a real gem that was um, carved around AD 198 to 200, Septimius Severus and his wife, Julia Domna, face right, their youthful sons, Caracalla and Geta, face left. As the youngest son, Geta is shown partially obscured in the shadow of his, father, of his brother. Geta, as prince, or Caesar, is bareheaded. Caracalla wears the laurel crown marking his rank as Augustus already sharing the responsibilities of emperor with his father. The story of Geta is bound inextricably with that of his father, who burned with ambition to establish a lasting and viable imperial dynasty. It is also intertwined with the rise of Caracalla, who as Severus's eldest son was the primary heir to the throne. Severus combined his love for his sons his quest for personal glory, his desire for lasting familial fame, and his occultic beliefs into a noxious brew. This led him to disastrously misjudge his son's capacity to co-rule the empire effectively and harmoniously. The rise and fall of Publius Septimius Geta is a story that encompasses universal themes that define our common humanity, as well as our potential for inhumanity, fatherly indulgence, motherly protection, sibling rivalry, betrayal, fratricide, and inconsolable grief. Although ancient, the story is reminiscent of a Shakespearean tragedy wherein a flawed 
high-ranking protagonist encounters a reversal of fortune and dies at the end of the play. The current coin is a portrait of Gaeta. It's a very, uh, you know, very well done portrait on this particular coin. This is him as a, I'd say, as an older, um, as an older teenager. And here's the entire coin. Uh, the reverse shows Minerva. And this coin, this particular one is possibly a unique variant. So it combines an obverse and reverse of some other, uh, of some other coin types that are known in the references. So as long as we're uh, talking about the references, and before we look at too many more coins, I'd like to just familiarize you with the rarity scales that I'm using. I'm using two different rarity scales for bronze coins, uh, imperial coins, coins that were minted at Rome. I'm using the Roman imperial coinage as a reference. That's a, that's a, a reference book and it's abbreviated as RIC. And that's a standard reference. Um, it's a little bit on the older side, but it's still considered a standard reference. And for the silver coins, again, the coins that are minted at Rome, we're gonna be looking at some that were minted in the provinces, but for the Roman silver coins called denarii, I'm using a different reference that's a little bit more accurate for silver coins because the author Philip Hill studied 26 hordes of mostly silver coins and the largest of those hoards contain 81,000. So without having counted them all up, I'd say there's probably a, about 100,000 coins um, that he, in those hoards that he studied. And if you see R4 as zero to one example, that's, that's relative to that, uh, that sample. So we don't know how many coins were minted. There are no mint records that survive from uh, from ancient times, or at least from ancient Roman times. And so all we can do is when we talk about rarity, we can talk about um, relative rarity based on the surviving examples. So if we say there's about 100,000 coins and only one out of those 100,000 is a particular type, then that doesn't mean that there's only one of those coins that exist, but it's one in 100,000 or something like that. So it's very, very rare. So R4 is, is, is super rare. And so you'll see these, um, these little rarity notations next to the coin images that I'm showing. All right, so destined to rule. Gaeta's elevation to the imperial throne occurred in the aftermath of the civil war that raged from AD 193 to 197. His father, Septimius Severus, as governor of Pannonia Superior, which is a Roman province, had been proclaimed emperor by the local legions. And you can see, speaking of the notation, if you look at the, uh, the notation on this coin, you can see this coin is noted, noted as R4. So that would be for Hill, that would be um, maybe one example in 100,000 coins. So this is a very rare coin. Severus used his cunning and superior military strength to, to defeat various rivals, ultimately becoming the uncontested ruler of Rome. Seeking to establish a dynasty as a means to consolidate power, in 196, Severus named his eight-year-old son Caracalla as Caesar, next in line to the throne. Then in 198, he elevated Caracalla to the rank of Augustus, making him co-ruler. To nine-year-old Gaeta, he bestowed the title of Caesar. Severus issued a brief series of coins, uh, of dynastic coins to mark the occasion, each bearing family portraits intended to represent Eternitas Imperii, or an eternity of Roman rule. And this coin is one of those coins. So this is a coin issued in the name of Julia Domna, who was Caracalla and Gaeta's mother. So she's on the obverse, they're on the reverse. And um, we can tell who is Caracalla on this because he at the time was Augustus and he's wearing the laurel wreath, laurel crown, which was reserved for the rank of Augustus and Gaeta is bareheaded and because he was the rank of Caesar, which is equivalent to like a, a prince or the next in line to the throne. 
Both brothers were celebrated on numerous coin types, presenting them as the inevitable successors to their father, as dutiful priests and as bringers of good fortune. On coins bearing the legend Princeps Iwentutus, or abbreviations thereof, the boys appear as first among the young or prince of youth, honorifics reserved for designated heirs to the throne. This coin type unique to Gaeta shows him leading his companions confidently from horseback. This is also another rare coin. So it's noted as R4 for Hill. Um, th there are more examples. It's probably not quite that rare. So we have to, we have to take the rarity scales at a, a little bit as a, at a grain of salt. So here's the obverse and the reverse of this coin. And I'm, I'm labeling Gaeta as the lead horseman. And I have a little question mark. I just said, this is, you know, he's leading his companions. We don't really know for sure. And, you know, looking at this as I, I was putting this presentation together, I'm thinking, well, maybe that lead horseman is supposed to be Septimius Severus and the two figures behind are Caracalla and Gaeta. Um, we don't really know. I mean, this is a unique Type to Gaeta, maybe the intention was that it was supposed to have been struck for Caracalla as well, and that's their father in the front. We don't really know. Divine associations assured dynastic continuity consecrated by the gods. The brothers' similarity of appearance encouraged their identification with the mythical Dioscuri, who were the twin protectors of Rome. Castor and Pollux are known in Roman mythology as the semi-divine Dioscuri. They were twin half-brothers and sons of their mother Leda, who was seduced by Jupiter after he took the form of a swan. So in this illustration, you can see Castor and Pollux riding, and Leda, their mother, is in the in the background, and she's she's you know kind of hanging out with the swan who is Jupiter in swan form. This reverse type links Gaeta with Castor of the Dioscuri, who was the mortal half-brother of the immortal Pollux. So this, this is a coin of Gaeta, and there he is next to his horse um, in the role of, uh, or uh, actually I should say that is Castor, it's not Gaeta, but um, the fact that, he's, that Gaeta has a reverse type um, showing Castor is a way that links him to a caster. He doesn't have a coin of Pollux. So we assume that since um, Pollux was the divine son of Jupiter, and he would be the um, higher ranking brother of the, as Augustus, and um, Paul, uh, Castor was the, the, the mortal son of um, Leda's, of another, father. On this provincial coin from Thracian Hadrianopolis, which is a, um, which was a city in the eastern provinces of Thrace, Gaeta is crowned by an eagle, the sacred symbol of Jupiter. The young prince's right to legitimate rule is thus conferred directly by the king of heaven, earth, justice, and all of the Olympian gods. And here's the obverse and reverse with Gaeta, a portrait of Gaeta on the obverse. And this coin is very rare. It's perhaps the second known example. So here are some denarii that have reverse types. These are denarii, they're all struck in the name of Gaeta and they show uh, they promote Gaeta as the dynastic co-heir alongside his brother Caracalla, and these were all minted from 198, uh, between 198 and 209. And most of them show uh, Gaeta on the reverse in the role of um, Princeps Iwentutis, which is the um, uh, Prince of Youth next in line to the throne. Uh, the one that's second from the left shows Gaeta clasping hands with the, the god Felicitas, so the legend is Felicitas Tempor, which is a uh, abbreviation. It means um, happiness of the times. The one at the far right 
Wota Publica is showing Geta and the role of priests and sacrificing over an altar. So Wota Publica is the public vows that the um, emperors or the uh, ruling family would take or the, in order to um, serve Rome. And then the second one from the right is showing some priestly implements of sacrifice, um, jug, wand, um, ladle for, for uh, libations, things like that. So we just took a look at a coin of Geta showing Castor on the reverse. And I thought that it would be interesting to show uh, a mint error. So on the right is an apparently unique error for this reverse type. It's been double struck from a rotated die. And you can see at the, the bottom of the error strike, at the bottom there's a, a kind of a ghosted image of Geta's head. And then the coin, the probably not the coin was rotated. So probably what happened is if you see this diagram of the way that uh, coins were struck in ancient times, the, the reverse was struck with a punch that was he held by hand. So it was held, held in the hand and then struck with a hammer. And all it would have taken is for the, um, you know, the, the person holding the die to get distracted for a moment, forget that he didn't put a new coin in there. Maybe he put the die down, picked it back up, rotated it, struck it again. And this is how we might get a, an error like this. Brotherly discord. Severus, Caracalla, and Geta presided over sacrifices held before and after military expeditions at which a bull was led to the altar in a solemn procession followed by a long column of soldiers. And here in this illustration, you can see Severus, Caracalla, and Geta on a platform presiding over a sacrifice. Coinage issued during the reign of Septimius Severus often promotes harmony between Caracalla and Geta, their family and the military. A prime example of this is this unique coin of Julia Domna from Tavium in Galatia, which celebrates the return of the empire to peace and stability after the civil war of 193 to 97 AD. It shows Caracalla, uh, Severus and Geta below a legend in Greek, praising them as eternal rulers. So here's the obverse and reverse of this coin. Um, you can see Geta is on the Geta is on the uh, right, and Caracalla is on the left. And we can tell it's Caracalla. First of all, he's a little bit taller because he's a little bit older. I think we can make out a laurel crown on his head. And Severus, since he is at this time, co-emperor with his, uh, uh, Septimius Severus, since he is co-emperor with his son, Caracalla, he's uh, shown clasping Caracalla's hand and not facing Caracalla rather than Geta. And this particular coin of Julia Domna is probably or possibly unique. It's not in any catalogs. It's the only one known of this reverse type for Julia Domna. The idea of familial and, fam uh, and military concord was important to advancing the public perception of dynastic stability and confidence in the perpetuation of sovereign rule. And so a lot of coin types, uh, a lot of provincial types like this one from this era show Severus, uh, I'm sorry, show Caracalla and Geta clasping hands in concord or in agreement. And this is a particularly well-struck example from um, Nicopolis in Moesa Inferior. Numerous coin types, as I just mentioned, thus depict the two heirs facing each other and clasping hands in agreement. Sometimes the brothers are shown performing sacrificial rites together, together or with military imagery. So on this coin, Cistercius of Rome, we can see Caracalla and Geta clasping hands over an altar. So they're performing some sort of sacrifice together. And the figure between them is a flute player. And you can see the flute player holding a, a, like a double flute. 
And here's the obverse showing a portrait of Gaeta. This is Gaeta as a, um, so this coin was struck in 210 when Gaeta was about 21 years old. He's got already got a full beard. He is now on this coin, he is now Augustus. So he wears the laurel crown of Augustus. Here's another coin showing um, Gaeta and Caracalla clasping hands. This is actually a coin of Caracalla, not Gaeta. And you can see how similar they look if you look at their portraits. And this one shows, rather than sacrificing over an altar, this one shows Caracalla. Uh, he's on the, on the left-hand side and he's being crowned by Apollo, we think. And Gaeta is on the right and he's being crowned by Hercules. And we can tell that that's Hercules because he's, he's uh, carrying a club and that is one of the attributes of the god, uh, the god Hercules. Now, I think it's interesting that we have on this coin, we have the uh, Gaeta and Caracalla, the brothers are, are, are kind of associating with the gods or um, semi-divine figures. And on this coin that we just looked at, it's more of a realistic scene. I mean, it's not, not realistic in the sense that, yes, they're, they're posed in, a, in kind of an artistic way, but, but this is a scene, and this could have actually happened and probably did, that they were sacrificing together um, more of a, a, a scene from real life. So it's the realm of you know, man and, and the real world, and then they're shown here in the, kind of in the realm of mythology or the gods. So they kind of they kind of have their, um, you know, their feet are in both, both worlds, the, the world of man and the world of the gods. During a period of peace from 203 to 207 AD, the boys developed an intense sibling rivalry fueled by their luxurious lifestyle in the imperial palace. The brothers also became increasingly indolent, carousing with charioteers and engaging in all sorts of petty crimes and abuses. It's what the life of luxury will do. Pleas from their mother, Julia, fell on deaf ears. In 208, Severus compelled them to accompany him on a military expedition to the remote island of Britannia, far removed from the debaucheries of Rome. In doing this, Severus hoped that the responsibilities of administration and command, along with the rigors of military discipline and the deprivations of camp life, would force the brothers to cooperate. So here's a map of um, showing Britannia. And above that, above Hadrian's Wall, we can see Caledonia, which is approximately um, the territory of present day Scotland. And this is the expedition that they went on. And this map, um, this actually overlaps a bit with another talk that I gave called um, uh, Virtus and Victoria. And it was focused on this particular, this, this military expedition but there's some overlap here and I thought it would be useful uh, for you to know, uh, to see a map and kind of see the type of uh, military expedition that they were on. And the photos here are photos that I took myself when I visited, I visited England back in 2008 and I traveled up to York, uh, which is where the Severans made their headquarters and which is where Gato was assigned to administrative duties in, in uh, York, or it was known as Eboracum then. And the, the pictures that I'm showing are, are Roman ruins. Um, the one at the lower, the lower right, uh, that is a view from the cathedral looking down at the part of the city that, that would have been approximately the location of the Roman fort at the time, uh, at you know, that time. So from York, they went, they would have gone uh, Severus and Caracalla, leaving Gaeta behind in York. They would have gone to South Shields, which was the um, supply base, the main supply base for the invasion of Caledonia. And that was a supply base. The, the supplies were transported mainly by, uh, by ship. And uh, Arbea is the name of the fortress there, of the supply base. And I also visited there. And these are my photos showing reconstructions of that Roman fort. So the, the, the photo at upper left 
is a reconstruction uh, you, in the background. You can see a reconstruction of the entrance to the fort. On upper right is a reconstruction of an army barracks. At lower left is a um, showing what it might have looked like a typical sort of um, um, army, like the interior of a barracks where the, the living conditions. And the one at lower right is showing the living uh, living conditions of the, the commanders um, much better off than the common soldiers. Okay, and then from Arbea, uh, they did need to repair Hadrian's wall. So they were invading Caledonia to put down in kind of a bit of an insurrection or invasion by the Caledonian um, tribes and then they damaged Hadrian's wall and knocked part of it down. So one of the missions of this expedition was to repair Hadrian's wall. And again, here are some photos of Hadrian's wall from my, from my own visit there a while ago. Now from Hadrian's wall, they would have, uh, again, Severus and Caracalla would have traveled with their armies up, up along Deer Street and made camp and then invaded Caledonia and um, made war upon the barbarians there. So this as, which is a denomination, A-S, as it's called, this as of Gaeta issued contemporaneously with these events shows Concordia, the personification of harmony standing among six legionary standards. It may have been issued to soldiers to evoke feelings of personal loyalty toward Gaeta. And here is the obverse and reverse showing Gaeta on the obverse. Gaeta as contentious co-emperor. Severus, Julia, Domna, and Gaeta made the sea crossing to Britannia in early AD 208. Caracalla probably arrived in 207. So more recent scholarship um, does put Caracalla more likely having gone ahead is more like a more like on a scouting mission. So he may have gone earlier than 208. Aside from his goal of military conquest, that is Severus's goal of military conquest over unruly Scottish tribes, Severus intended to use the war to transform his sons into tough and able dynastic successors. And actually that is a, here's a print showing Gaeta as Augustus. I mean, he died, Gaeta was about 21, 22 years old at this time, but this print shows him looking quite, um, I don't know, wise and, and, and seems a little bit more middle-aged than that. All right, so uh, again, I did say there was some overlap with another talk that I gave, and this is a slide that I did take from that talk. So I, I encourage you, if you're interested in this time period and, and the coins of this uh, invasion to check out that talk that's available on the ANA uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so in 210 and 211, or in 210, uh, the Severans declared victory against the Caledonians and they struck coins with images of Victoria on the reverse, the goddess of victory, and the title Victoria Britannica means British victories. And these are a variety of types. These, these encompass all the various types for each of these uh, co-emperors. So there are eight different types, four for Gaeta, uh, four for Septimius Severus and two each for Caracalla and Gaeta. And um, we think that there were eight workshops, eight individual workshops striking coins in the Rome Mint. And it looks to, to us, uh, to I say us, to numismatists who study this stuff, that um, four workshops were devoted to striking the coins of Septimius Severus, and two each were devoted to striking coins of Caracalla and Gaeta. With a premonition of his own impending death as foretold to him by a seer, Severus also hoped to achieve a psychological victory over his sons that would put an end to their rivalry. The infirm Severus died at Eboracum, which again is present day York 
on 4 February 211. His, on his deathbed, Severus advised them to be harmonious, enrich the soldiers, and scorn all other men. Caracalla and Gaeta were thus proclaimed co-emperors, but Caracalla seized absolute power for himself, leaving Gaeta to rule in name only. So I should say something about this, this painting. This painting is showing Septimius Severus on his deathbed or his sickbed, and he's pointing to his son Caracalla, who, um, who, who is said tried to murder him. He, was, he, he knew that Septimius Severus was already ill, but he was trying to hurry things along because he wanted to, um, he wanted to take over and take the absolute power. So this, this painting is showing um, Severus kind of berating his son Caracalla, and it said that he left a sword within his son's reach and challenged him to finish the job that he botched earlier. And Caracalla backed down. Um, but according to uh, Herodian, who is a Roman historian, Caracalla was constantly trying to convince, convince Severus's doctors to hasten the dying emperor's demise. Several coin types record the family's return trip to Rome. And the family, meaning Julia, Domna, um, Gaeta, and Caracalla, because Severus died at York, but they took their father's body back to Rome and had a state funeral for him. But anyway, one of these coins, which is uh, showing here, bears an image, or one of these types, I should say, bears an image of Fortuna Redux, who ensured the emperor's safe travels. So Fortuna is a goddess and the epitaph, uh, epitaph redux means um, fortune returns. So here is, it's a coin of Geta and there he is as Augustus with a full beard and laurel, laurel, uh, laurel crown. Even before their arrival, the brothers pretended to love each other, but were opposites in every respect. In Rome, their mutual mistrust grew as they cultivated rival political factions. They divided the imperial palace in half, each keeping to his side, and there was talk of splitting the empire between them. The brothers' differences were manifest even on coinage as each chose his own imagery. One example is this type unique to Geta featuring Janus, the god of new beginnings, perhaps invoked to ease the transition from the firm rule of Severus to the harmonious co-rule of his sons. Yet Caracalla did not share this sentiment and the situation became intolerable. Now the god Janus has a, a face looking forward to the future and a face looking backward to the past. Here's the obverse and reverse again showing uh, showing Geta as Augustus, full beard. At this time, he was about 21 or 22 years old. And here are some types of denarii that promote Geta's claim to the throne. And they show various gods that he's associating with. Um, there's a type of him on horseback spearing, a, spearing an enemy on the left-hand side. Uh, there's another type of him um, third from the right on horseback, uh, Adventus Augusti, which is the, the uh, legend is saying the, the arrival of the emperors. So Augusti is plural. So it's saying the arrival from Britannia um, of Severus and Caracalla. I mean, sorry, Geta and Caracalla. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look again at the slide of um, the, the earlier slide uh, showing uh, Geta as Caesar. And if you look at the rarity on these, most of them are more in the common zone with the C and the little, the little number next to the C, two and three, that the, the higher the number, the more common that they are. Uh, there's a few that are scarce. There's one that's very rare, but for the most part, they're fairly common. 
And if you look at the ones as, of him as, um, as Augustus from 209 to 211, those are the years that he was Augustus, um, most of them are scarce to rare. So you know, why is this? Probably because he was Augustus for only a few years where he was Caesar for quite a, for quite a few years. And it's interesting too, to look at the physical resemblance between Septimius Severus, Caracalla and Gaeta. Uh, they look pretty similar. And sometimes on some of the coins, especially well of Caracalla and Gaeta, it can be hard to tell them apart. And only, um, only the legend or, or the, you know, the, the titles, um, Gaeta or Antoninus, which is uh, Caracalla's given name, um, are we are we absolutely sure? But uh, around this time, around 211, Car uh, Gaeta resembled his father Severus more than Caracalla did, and he took advantage of this. I, they had kind of like if you look at the coin of Severus and the coin uh, coins of Gaeta here, they look they have kind of similar noses. Um, and around 211, Gaeta started to have his portrait depicted with this sort of forked beard like his father, an imitation of his father. And um, we think that this is a way for him to kind of uh, associate, uh, have people associate him as the, as the natural successor to his father since he looked more like him. Honoring Gaeta on provincial portraiture. The coins of Gaeta form a remarkable sequence of portraiture showing a clear progression from smooth-cheeked innocent boy to ungainly adolescent to fully bearded careworn man. Eastern portraits from the Severan era, which spans from AD 193 to 235, generally adhere to this Hellenistic style, which sought to capture the true to life individualism of their subjects. Differences of quality and style between the coinage of numerous provincial cities depended largely upon the training and skill of local dye engravers. Some of these bronze provincial portraits um, here, there, there's just a wide variety of, of um, styles and maybe some are more competent or more aesthetically refined than others. So it it's, can be kind of hard to pin down exactly what Gaeta or his brother or you know, Severus, any, any ancient um, ruler for that matter would have looked like. Dozens of provincial mints were active during the Seven er Severan era. This map marks the locations of a select few. So these are the locations of uh, the mints for all the coins that are being shown in this exhibit, I have an exhibit, it's a, it's a talk I, based on an exhibit that I did. So all the coins shown in this talk are from the cities shown in the map, but there were many more. Um, this is just a limited number. At Laodicea Admer, and I have it abbreviation, uh, abbreviated on the map as Laodicea, it's in Syria. Imperial denarii were struck for Gaeta and his family from AD 198 to 202. These were produced alongside a local denomination called the Tetradrome. And I wanted to show you the difference, um, a comparison. The Tetradrome was a standard denomination of the mostly Greek speaking East, larger and heftier than the denarius, it provided a more expansive canvas for the inclusion of artistic detail. So the tetradrome in the center, this is not my coin. This is a coin uh, that I borrowed the image from, from CNG, but I, I show them here to about uh, scale. So you can see how much larger the tetradrome is than the denarii. And you can see a difference in style and the amount of detail and the type of um, iconography that's being used between the, um, the denarii and the tetradrome. Uh, and also the tetradrome is in, uh, the legends are in Greek, whereas the denarius, denarii are in 
Latin. And I also just wanted to show a, uh, an example from Rome, just so you can see a difference, a visual difference in the style. These Eastern portraits are best described as veristic rather than realistic. This is because it is impossible for us to check how closely the appearance of any given portrait would have matched the true appearance of the actual living person. Because we just, we don't know, we don't have a photograph of the living person. And if we look at a, each coin, the portrait's slightly different. So we just, we can get a, a kind of a sense of, of what they look like um, in, in true to life meaning like in this example, there's like the furrowed brow and, and you know, um, just looks fairly like life lifelike trying to capture the essence of a lifelike individual but but realistic would would say yeah that, that that's what he looks like exactly and we really don't know so this is also um a slide that is kind of a crossover from my other talk that focuses on the uh the caledonian campaigns in britannia but this is very interesting and in, if we're looking at the portraiture just in the sense that um, three of these are coins showing uh, portraits of of Gaeta and one of them is a coin showing a portrait of Caracalla that's these are labeled but that's the one at the lower uh, at the lower right and you really they almost look alike I think the the only way to tell the difference uh, to be sure is is the titles in the legend uh, also interesting too, if from a collector standpoint of ancient coins anyway, is the obverse die link uh, between the two coins on the on the left. Now in modern coins, that's you know a dial, you know it's not a big deal, but in ancient coins they were struck by hand and the dies didn't last very long. And when you find die linkages like this, it generally means that there were fewer dies being struck, which means that there were fewer. Uh, I'm sorry, fewer dies being made, which means there were fewer coins being struck. So these coins tend to be pretty rare when you find a die link in ancient coins like this. The differences uh, between Gaeta and Caracalla as rival co-rulers seemed in insurmountable. So we're getting toward the end of Gaeta's reign. Each fortified his separate apartment in the Imperial Palace to guard against the threat of assassination by the other. A treaty was drawn for the division of territory. Caracalla would govern Rome in the west, Gaeta would govern Egypt in the east. This arrangement would have certainly destroyed the empire, tearing it asunder and degenerating into civil war. On 26 December, AD 211, the brothers agreed to meet with their mother, Julia Domna in her apartment to discuss reconciliation on peaceful terms. Here, Caracalla treacherously directed some hidden centurions to rush upon Gaeta, who sought protection at his mother's breast. Julia, covered in blood and wounding her hand, tried in vain to deflect a hail of sword blows as the 22-year-old Gaeta died in her arms. Caracalla forbade her to mourn him. So in this print, Caracalla commits uh, I should say it's not a print, it's a drawing. It's not an actual print. Caracalla commits fratricide by his own hand in this 18th century French drawing. More likely is that he commanded a group of loyal centurions to accomplish the bloody deed for him. Caracalla consolidated his power by ordering the mass slaughter of Gaeta's supporters. Nonetheless, uh, he recognized that his younger brother had been held in general favor by most soldiers and citizens. And could that have something to do with his resemblance to his father? Caracalla thus moved to appease the populace, granting to Gaeta the honor of an emperor's funeral and the status of a god. Yet he also ordered Gaeta's name and image to be expunged from all mo public monuments and inscriptions. And here are a couple examples. <clears throat> um, the uh, Severin Tondo, which is the round painting here on wood, you can see the family, um, <clears throat> the formerly happy family, Severus, 
Julia, Caracalla and Gaeta and, Car and, and Gaeta's face has been scrubbed out. <clears throat> and on the marble relief from the arch of the Argentarii in Rome, uh, we see Severus and Julia Domna and that space right next to Julia Domna is where Gaeta would have been. This is now a blank space. But for practical reasons, this damnatio memoriae or com condemnation of the memory does not seem to have included the widespread melting of Gaeta's coinage. And practical because they were just, they were distributed everywhere and it, it would be hard to recall all these just to melt them down. But instances of private defacement do exist, but are rare. On this denarius, a series of violent chisel blow, blows has cut Gaeta's neck and removed a large portion of his face. This is probably an unofficial damnatio. And um, while I was putting this together and I, I was looking at this coin, I kind of blew it up to show on the slide and I thought, wow, I can actually, I can actually identify or, or see the, like the chisel marks. And you can see that this was deliberately done. So if I, if I go back, kind of back and forth, you can see where there's these cut marks. And uh, this was when damnatios like this, usually the target was the, the, of the portrait was the sense organs, like the ears and the mouth and the, you know, cut the neck and that sort of thing. So a, no, a lot of times the nose. So here, you know, Gaeta's ears and neck has been cut off. So here's the obverse and the reverse showing Minerva. And one way that we can tell that this is, a, this is ancient damage and not modern. So for example, if this was a metal detectorist, um, you know, sticking a shovel in the ground and taking a chunk out of the coin, well, there's circulation wear to the edges of this, um, this damage. So we can see it's kind of worn down. And if that happened in modern times, it would not be, it would not look worn like that. So that's evidence of, a, of that the damage is ancient, that somebody defaced the coin and then it went back into circulation. But magistrates of a few cities in Asia Minor, perhaps in a show of loyalty to their new sole master, systematically recalled large bronze civic coins bearing images of Gaeta facing another family member. And most of these coins are um, facing, uh, showing Gaeta and Caracalla facing each other, but there are a few that show um, Gaeta facing Severus, and I think a few that show Gaeta facing uh, Julia Domna. After Gaeta's portrait had been erased, the coins were revalidated with a countermark and placed back into circulation. And you can see a countermark or the traces of a countermark in, uh, in this red rectangle where Gaeta's portrait used to be. And here's the entire coin. Here's another example. Um, I should say that this one is from um, Pergamum and Mycia. This one is from Stratonicea and Caria. Those are the two cities that um, recalled, it's about 95% of the coins like this showing um, Caracalla Gaeta or, or Gaeta and, and Severus uh, have been, uh, Gaeta's portrait has been chiseled out and then uh, they were placed back into circulation. So that, that tells us that it was very systematic. And here's, here's another example from Stratonicea. All right, so um, I, if you're interested in that, so I, I kind of glossed over a bit the, um, the civic coinage where, where Gaeta's portrait has been erased. It's a lot more complicated. Uh, it's those two main cities. There are other cities in, in uh, Asia Minor where that was done, but it wasn't done in a, it doesn't seem that it was done in as, in as thorough a way. But in the bibli bibliography here, I'm recommending that if you're interested in that, to read Defacing the Past by Dario Calamino. It's very good. It's got a lot of illustrations of, of coins and other things like the monuments and inscriptions and things like that that have been defaced. It's, a, it's an excellent book. So um, if you're interested, go get that. 
So I think I'm ready for some questions. Thought I'd, I thought I'd show you a picture of myself in, that was taken when I visited Hadrian's Wall. So a great thanks. picture, Michael. And uh, <laughs> thank, thank you again, seriously, for a wonderful and educational presentation on Geta. Um, oh, my pleasure. Hope everyone enjoyed it uh, and learned as much as I did. And of course, again, we want to thank Gray Sheet for their partnership with the ANA Learning Academy. Uh, before we go any further, um, I don't see any questions that came in. Hmm. That's what happens when you explain everything so oh. well. You know? <laughs> okay. Well, so, all right. Yeah, and then uh, see any come in, but uh, hopefully uh, people will uh, have the opportunity to uh, speak with you whenever they see you at shows. Are you coming to our National Money Show in March out in uh, Colorado Springs? I'm, ho I'm hoping to, to make it there, yeah. Nice, hope so. Yeah, we will have uh, money talks there as well. So, um, folks, uh, we uh, hope you will join us for our future webinars. Uh, please check the ANA website, money.org, uh, for more information under the events and webinars heading. Uh, so you can see the schedule of upcoming eLearning Academy presentations, as well as uh, gain access to our archived webinars and video recordings. Our next presentation is scheduled to take place on Wednesday, December 15th, starting at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time, when our own ANA Vice President, Joseph Bowling, presents Loose Ends, More on Fakes Targeting Collectors, More on Official Counterfeiting. Michael Kotis, thanks again. Great presentation. Everyone out there, please have a wonderful rest of your day and enjoy our hobby and have a safe and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you much. Thanks again, Michael.